So I think we uh, will get uh, started. I'll just make a few introductory um, remarks to get going. Uh, my name's Rob Wilson, and I'm a professor of philosophy here in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Alberta. And I'm also the project director for Living Archives on Eugenics in Western Canada, which is a five-year uh, project funded by the Community University Research Alliance Program of SHRC. And we're in our second uh, year, and the event that we have on today is part of a series of eight or nine events throughout the whole week of um, Alberta Eugenics Awareness Week, uh, which received a mayoral proclamation um, declaring it as a U Alberta Eugenics Awareness Week, thanks to the hard work of uh, Moira Lang, our project uh, coordinator, over the last uh, couple of months. So um, we have a couple of events remaining. Uh, one is the Kay Burns's. Um, uh, talk perambulate, uh, which will talk about her renaming of the footbridge that connects Riverdale and Cloverdale, um, the Lalani Muir footbridge, and the placards there are still on the bridge to prove that it's real, and it really is the Lalani Muir footbridge now. <laughs> and um, I think uh, uh, Kay will be talking more generally about this kind of artistic uh, intervention and uh, this way of performing. Uh, our past and uh, uh, tomorrow at two o'clock uh, downtown at the Faculty of Extension. Have further details if anyone's interested who doesn't have them uh, already. And then we have an art show that's op opening, curated by one of our summer interns, Anne Pasek. Downtown, two o'clock uh, is the opening reception for that, um, called the Collective Memory Project Responses to Eugenics in Alberta. Um, and it runs for a month down at the Faculty of Extension Gallery. And I think this opening will be a really exciting uh, opening. The artwork is pretty spectacular, the bits of it that I've seen. And um, the artwork comes from uh, a lot of work over the last few months that Anne's put into arranging some open studio time, some discussion groups of, uh, with members of the community uh, around um, eugenics. And uh, there are a number of people in a number of forms of institutionalization who have contributed artwork. And uh, we'll have uh, some politicians present, we'll have some uh, high-level members of the university present to make some opening remarks and, and also just get some uh, uh, you know, free wine and... Um, no, there's no wine. There's no wine. No wine. Okay, so no, so no. no wine. It's so free it's not there. All right. So that's Sunday and that'll wind up our week. Um, so today uh, we're here um, uh, for a session uh, on Margaret W. Thompson. And um, it's prompted very much by the person on my uh, far right, uh, Rob Wells. Um, and I'll let him say more about his particular piece as it moves on. But um, um, there was a petition uh, that was put in to have Margaret Thompson's Order of Canada revoked. There's a formal procedure that you can go through for that. And uh, um, Rob initiates such a procedure and he can tell us a little bit more about um, the whole uh, process and what else he has to say uh, um, about that. The other panellist is Amir Farouk, who was one of our summer interns a couple of years ago, the last 2010. And uh, uh, Amir is now in medicine or pre-med still? I'm uh, in my second year of medicine. Second year of medicine mm -hmm. and uh, was in the biological science beforehand and, and expressed a real interest in the way in which science was used and misused in the eugenic era, especially at the University of Alberta. For example, how eugenics was taught, how eugenics was... Uh, wrapped into uh, uh, genetics and, and, and so on and what was known, trying to dig up old syllabi and things like that. And also has an interest in how we remember the, the past from independent work. I'll let me may say more things about that as well. So I'll just um, close these opening remarks by just giving some sorts of um, basic facts about uh, Margaret Thompson. Uh, she graduated from the University of Saskatchewan um, uh, with a BSc in uh, 1943. She did a PhD at the University of Toronto, graduating in 1948, and came to the University of Alberta in 1950 as a um, uh, professor in genetics. Um, and she was here until 1963, at which time she moved uh, back to the University of uh, t Toronto. And uh, she maintained an, appoint an appointment as a professor of genetics there until her um, retirement. In 1972, uh, she was the president of the um, Genetic Society of Canada. In 1988, she was uh, awarded a, um, an Order of Canada. In between the years of 1960 and 1962, while she was here at the University of Alberta, she served as one of the four members of the Alberta Eugenics Board. 
um, primarily because of her uh, PhD in genetics. Uh, she was one of two so-called medical experts who were to be appointed onto this um, uh, board, which approved um, sterilization requests that were brought forward um, uh, by typically uh, superintendents or other personnel associated with um, institutions uh, like Alberta Hospital, Pinoca, or the provincial uh, training school. Um, in 1995, uh, Margaret Thompson was called as an expert witness, I, I believe, by the government mm -hmm. um, to testify in Lalani Muir's trial. Uh, sorry, I should rephrase that. The, tri <laughs> the trial proceedings uh, brought about by Lalani Muir's lawsuit against the province um, of Alberta for wrongful confinement and sterilization. And she, Margaret Thompson, uh, not only gave testimony in that case, but uh, also featured in the film, The Sterilization of the Lani Muir. I don't believe she was an expert witness. Oh, she, not an expert witness? No, she was called as a former employee or officer of the defendant. As, thanks for the clarification. The rules of examining somebody in court are, are different. Okay, good. Good. You were here, Doug. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, so it was in that, um, um, the evidence that she provided there and some of the comments that were, were uh, captured in the film that Glennis Whiting directed that we showed at the beginning of Alberta Eugenics Awareness Week uh, last Saturday, uh, that I think she, Margaret Thompson, came to broader attention uh, of people as uh, somebody who had been uh, fairly actively involved in this uh, eugenic past in um, Alberta. Um, she has continued to be, uh, throughout the uh, 60s, 70s and 80s, uh, quite active as a consultant with the Toronto Hospital for Sick Children, especially around genetic counselling and advice to hospital staff and to parents uh, uh, working with children uh, largely with uh, genetically specified um, conditions, um, whether it's prenatally or, or postnatally. Uh, something I actually didn't know and sent its own chill down my spine because of some of the other um, interactions I've had uh, involving that particular uh, hospital. Uh, but that's all I want to say in, in opening things up uh, before turning things over to Rob Wells, who will say a little bit more about Margaret Thompson, the petition, the Order of Canada. And the format will be Rob will talk probably for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, we'll have an opportunity for some quick questions. Um, and then uh, Amir will talk for about the same amount of time, same format, and then we'll, if this goes according to plan, you should have a good 20, 25 minutes for open discussion back and forth. We are filming the event um, today. If you don't want to appear in the film, no problems. We can't include you in anything, any finished product without your permission and consent form. Um, and you can even just signal, look, if there's anything with me in it, just take it out straight away. We can do that. What we really want to do, because a lot of what our, our project is about is increasing public awareness, heightening public debate, we want to have a record of the kinds of issues that are coming up and then think about ways we might be able to package this kind of thing for education in schools, for um, you know, modules that might be used in um, genetics courses on campus or uh, one-off uh, lectures or so on. Sometimes it doesn't work out like that, but we've been pretty successful um, in the past of, of capturing some good interchanges and, and some interesting things that will otherwise just disappear from the public record, if you like. So um, with that said, uh, Rob Wells, thanks for coming and in some sense instigating uh, this kind of uh, discussion today. Well, thanks for the invitation. I'm, I'm proud to be here. I just wanted to uh, clarify a few things about myself. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an academic. I'm not a professional. I'm not a member of any organization. So I'm very much a loose cannon. So I'm totally free to point the finger wherever I feel it's appropriate, although I try to be reasonable. Uh, so uh, it does give me a freedom to be very objective about what I doing my, what I think is my conscience to do. My first encounter with the eugenics program probably came in about grade four, and I think we had a, a course in grade four on civic government, and we had a book, and it had all the different boards and things of government, and we were informed about the eugenics board, and I remember having nightmares about it. This is, this is as a 10-year-old boy, knew there was something seriously wrong. Uh, now, I, I have to admit that I failed in my duties as a citizen after that to speak up. Uh, you get involved with your own careers, plus we were in a province where our premier was the voice of God. And who was an ordinary person to criticize the government? 
uh, which I've long gone beyond that uh, view now, but at the time it was very difficult to even question any of those things. It was just seen as what was appropriate to be done. So uh, I do have to apologize because as a citizen I failed the, the victims of the sterilization program and I think we all did that. And, and it's one of the things that uh, maybe a lesson we need to learn is to look at what's going on today and look around us and open our eyes to the things that we're blinded to. Uh, the Order of Canada is the highest civil honor that's awarded to any, any uh, citizen of Canada. And uh, anyone can nominate someone for it. There also is a provision for people to petition to remove someone. But I was shocked to find out I'm the first ordinary citizen who's ever petitioned to have someone removed from the Order of Canada. They've, they've removed David Henneke for his uh, anti-Jewish comments. They've they removed uh, Steve Fagno because he has some substance abuse problems and he's got in trouble. Minor discrepancies with the law. Um, but when, when this came out and I was aware that Margaret Thompson got the Order of Canada, I just felt I had to do something. So I started researching and I got a copy of the, of the court decision that Madam Justice Veit wrote and I was really, I have to applaud her because she put a lot in there that a lot of justices could have swept under the rug is not really relevant but she was, she was quite courageous in, in her uh, decision and she was very damning about the program and also about Margaret Thompson and her, and her testimony and some of the actions that were going on, like uh, the sterilization of, of people who were not mentally, mentally handicapped, um, the castration of Down syndrome boys who were already infertile, not for sterile, not to protect the public, but for her genetic research. And that's what really appalled me, that this to me is the same kind of stuff that Dr. Mengele was doing, except maybe not quite on that same scale, but uh, where's, the, where's the conscience of the person involved in that? that, was, that um, and this happened long after the, the Nuremberg war trials, the, the, the codes that came out from the Nuremberg codes on, on, on medical research and so on, and how could it be that academics at the U of A were not aware of, the, of that? It, it's boggles my mind that this could be still going on after 1947, the Nuremberg War Trials. Anyway, um, so I, I made the, I made the, I think it was April last year, I sent in the, the, the petition and asked that she be stripped. I quoted many, many sections of the, of the um, Madam Justice Veidt decision in, in Lelani Muir's lawsuit decision. And uh, it just sat there and sat there and sat there. And finally in January, I got a letter back saying, no, that they're, they're not, uh, they won't act on it. So, I, the, the awards committee is headed up by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And I kept, keep asking myself, where is the justice? <laughs> but to be fair, the process is such that when, when a, a, a petition comes in like this, procedural fairness, if, if it's not deemed to be frivolous and vexatious right on, on the surface, if there's any substance to it, then they send a copy to the, to the recipient for their opportunity to respond. Now, I have no idea what, ma uh, what uh, Dr. Thompson's response was, so obviously I'm not fully informed because this is all confidential process at the awards committee. But uh, I, I think that the, the judgment of, of the Court of Queen's bench was so damning that I can't see how she could have uh, justified it. And she's continued to justify it even in that court case, to justify her actions. And not to apologize for the abuses, but to still justify it makes me really, really angry, which is why I think this was so essential that this, uh, this went on. Anyway, I've, I've got a copy here of the petition that I can circulate to anybody who wants it. Um, it, it outlines the facts, I think, pretty clearly. Um, there's a couple things, too, that I, I, I think that this whole matter of the eugenics board, um, Giving Margaret Thompson the Order of Canada is a further assault and a slap in the face of the victims. It, it is just unconscionable. We also have, I don't know how many of you know, but the, the social credit health minister at the time was pushing and pushing and pushing the board for more sterilizations, more sterilizations. And we honor that Dr. W.W. Cross by naming the Cross Cancer Clinic after him to honor him. 
Where is the justice in that? That name should come off that building, as far as I'm concerned. Um, my other concern is the way our society in general, and I'm not just talking, I'm talking about the media, I'm talking about the university, I'm talking about all aspects of it. We want to deny that castrations took place for medical research. I wrote a letter to the Edmonton Journal about Margaret Thompson, and they edited all that out before they printed it. It's, it's no different than the, than the Japanese society being in denial about the atrocities of the rape of Nanking. We cannot deny the facts that happened. We can only recognize them and make damn sure we don't repeat them. But if we sweep them under the rug, this is what's happening. So anyway, that's, um, th that's what really has me upset is the, when you turn around and you, you tell people that, no, it wasn't sterilizations. These were brutal, you butchered people and, and medical research wasn't, wasn't done for the purpose of the act even, as, as unethical as that was. The acts were carried out far beyond the scope of the legal, legal scope of what the legislation was. And yet, there's nobody been held accountable for that. If I conspired with someone to castrate some boy that was dating my daughter, you wouldn't see me around for a long time. <laughs> but Dr. Margaret Thompson did exactly that for her medical research. And she is consultant for Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, Professor Emeritus at, U at Toronto, uh, uh, University of Toronto, and has the Order of Canada. Now, what, what message does that send to our society? That's, uh, so, I, I guess I'll just close by, by you know, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to respond. But I think it's important for us to not only look at the problems in the past, but to open our eyes to the abuses that are going around us today. Uh, when I look and I see the homeless people on this street, many of these people have been cut out of mental institutions with no supports, no housing. That is a violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's right. And as individuals, we have a responsibility to make our government accountable. There, there's example after example, whether it's killing the kid in the elevator in the courthouse, whether it's the, um, um, well, I mean, the abuses at the, at the remand center here and so on. And I, I think I've just urged us all to open our eyes and, and perhaps take a cause that we feel important and, and stand up and be counted because that's our duty as citizens of a democratic country. And so thank you all for, for listening to me. Thanks, Robert. Is there any, again, to keep to the format that was outlined, quick sorts of questions for, for Rob? Do you want to pass those around? And yeah. maybe. Do you intend to pursue this matter further now that you have a matter of rejection? Is this the end of that story? I feel I have hit a brick wall. But there's a saying from electricians, when you hit a brick wall, you find a way to, if you can't go through it, you go over it or under it or around it. Uh, so I am toying with other options. I do think this is something which ought to be created more, more public attention. I did it the formal, appropriate way, and uh, if that's a brick wall, I think I need to pursue uh, other alternatives, which may be going to one of these Avaz uh, internet uh, petitions or something like that because I, I don't think it should be allowed to just I know it's it's swept under the rug and it's very convenient for the awards committee because they don't want to admit they made a mistake in the first place and it's embarrassing for a lot of institutions and governments that this happened and it's a, a, and it's a black mark on Canadian society as a whole and it would be much easier just to forget about it but I don't think it's appropriate to forget about it so. Do you, think that, do you think there's something special about Margaret Thompson as opposed to other members of the board who, apart from the fact that she's still living? Yes, it's a good question. Um, my, my concern with the board was there was nobody on the board to represent the interests of the, of the individuals, to advocate for them, whatever. We do have like a children's advocate now and some of these uh, social services things and so on. At the time, these are all professionals all with that same mindset of you know eugenics and, and you know keeping a strong British race here and so on. Um, 
But Margaret Thompson went beyond that. And when she was counseling Dr. Levan, I believe, to castrate Down syndrome boys for medical research purposes, I mean, if they had testicular cancer or something, that's totally different. But this was for no purpose whatsoever other than her benefit and her research and her self-aggrandizement as her profession with absolutely no concern for the individuals. And in the, in the, according to, the, to the, um, the decision, the court decision, when she was asked about the sterilization of the, of the, of the hearing impaired boy who had an IQ of 76, which was over, way over the 70 limit, she said, I thought we were doing him a favor. She thought they were doing him a favor to sterilize someone against the will. And against the will. That's, why I, that's why I think she is the one that I've targeted. Now, there may be other doctors in there or people on that board who have been involved in other things I don't know about. But, but Margaret Thompson's name come out in the uh, very loud and clear in that uh, uh, court decision. And I'm surprised there wasn't a criminal investigation because that should have been investigated as conspiracy to commit grievous uh, assault and bodily, causing bodily harm. It's definitely criminal. It wasn't within the scope at all of the legislation. Moira, did you have a question? Sorry. No, I think it's been answered. Mark? Yeah, I was just wondering if now that they've considered the petition and rejected it, does that mean they will not consider further ones? Do they think, okay, we've already ruled on this, so they won't consider further ones, or do you know if they would consider from someone else, for example? The process is one not of a popularity thing. Like if I nominate someone for an award, they look at the merits only, and it doesn't matter if 10,000 people or 100,000 people wrote a petition to support that person, they look at the merits and make the decision strictly on the merits. It appears to me that they've rejected it on the merits of my petition. So unless I could come up with some other smoking gun, if, for example, there was a criminal investigation and she was found guilty of conspiracy to commit criminal assault, for example, and convicted, then I think there would be new evidence and they would consider a new, a new petition, or they might even initiate it themselves. But as it stands now, without any further evidence, any further uh, uh, documentation, I think this has hit a brick wall as far as they're concerned, although uh, as independent as they are, um, Political pressure is always a factor, even when it's denied, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks. Uh, Amir. So uh, I'm glad to be here once again. And I, you know, since I've started medical school, I think uh, definitely looked back and appreciated a lot of the stuff that I've gotten, I, I gained from doing my internship with the Living Archives of Eugenics in Alberta. So again, I'm I'm very happy to be here, and uh, and I'm glad that uh, Mr. Wells actually put this all together so that it, that we can actually talk about some of these issues. And I think that that um, I'll, the the thing that I have kind of identified from this this is that um, it raises a lot of issues about like doc, like Dr. Wilson said, it raises a lot of issues about how we remember the past about research and about the way that um, healthcare professionals and scientists deal with um, their research subjects. So I think that, uh, like, I can't, I don't know a lot more about Margaret Thompson in particular other that, than that she was a geneticist, that she testified at the trial, and uh, that she got the Order of Canada. But, uh, but I think I can talk a little bit about some of the wider issues that I researched during my internship. And it's, it, it's, I'm glad that Dr. Walson is here because one of the things that I looked at during my internship was the whole issue with John McEachern. So John McEachern was the first provost of the University of Alberta and was also the president of the Alberta Eugenics Board for many years. And uh, he was also the, the, I think, I believe the, the first head of the psychology department. Is that right? Philosophy and psychology. Ph philosophy and psychology. So... Uh, back when Dr. Walston was here at University of Alberta, there used to be a portrait that hung in the the, philo the psychology uh, meeting room. So 
I think quite rightfully so, for many of the same reasons, and probably even more in the case of John McEachern, Dr. Walston actually put in a, um, you know, a motion to actually get rid of that uh, portrait. Now, I think the, the issue that gets raised here is the idea of looking back at the actions that people have done and putting our own judgments into what they've done. And I, I think we all have to do that to a certain extent. We all have to look back at our past and make some decisions about, well, do we think that this was right? Or do we think that this was wrong? Or what do we, at least to a certain extent, want to we learn from the things that have happened in the past? But the question is, to what extent can we actually go back and start judging all the things that have happened in the past? So uh, to give you another example, we know the famous five in Alberta are all widely revered for their work in feminism. And we have a, a scholarship that's named after her, after Louise McKinney, who's one of the famous five. And that's awarded to the top 2.5% uh, uh, to the students who are in the top 2.5% of their faculty. So it's obviously a prestigious award. We have a Louise McKinney Park. So we, we've honored her in a number of different ways. And Louise McKinney was an outspoken supporter of eugenics and of uh, sterilization. So the question is now do we go back and actually start renaming all these parks, renaming all these um, scholarships? And I think people would for, people would have some objections to that, or some people might people might raise not some me. maybe not <laughs> Dr. Well, or Mr. Wells, but I, I'm sure that other people would have objections to that idea. And and you can go on kind of thinking about other people who have received honors and awards, who have expressed really quite obvious racial and quite obvious eugenic tendencies. James Watson, who's the Nobel Prize winner, right, uh, uh, and d discoverer of uh, discoverer of the uh, of the fact that DNA is a genetic molecule, he has. I mean, the number of things that he said are incredible. I mean, quite uh, recently he was quoted as saying, "You know, all the the aid that we give to Africa, it's predicated on this idea that Africans are actually." the same as us, they can actually rationalize the same as us, and that's the fundamental problem with the aid that we give to, to Africa, right? So now are we going to go back and uh, take away his Nobel Prize? I mean, I wouldn't mind. I think that there, there are a number of things that, the things that he said are incredibly racist and, and deserve some censure. But I, I think that this is something that we're going to have to deal with more and more as our own society's values change, that we're going to look back at things that have happened and the, the, we have to decide at what point can we actually come in and change what's gone on? What, what point do we actually, at what level are we justified in censuring? So uh, you mentioned David Hennenke, uh, who was uh, stripped of his Order of Canada for making anti-Semitic remarks. Mm -hmm. What's different about David Hennenke versus Margaret Thompson, right? So... And we'd agree that making anti-Semitic remarks would be is justification for removing the Order of Canada in his case. So why isn't it justified in the case of Margaret Thompson, right? So this this is just one of the issues that uh, I think that gets raised from this whole petition. I don't think it's necessarily an easy question to resolve. Uh, I mean, my my younger brother recently wrote an article in uh, the Edmonton Journal about the Grandin mural. And that that celebrates that that's a mural at the Grandin station for the LRT, and that actually yeah. celebrates um, Grandin, who was uh, uh, the you know he started residential schools here in Alberta for Aboriginal people, right? So and there was huge furor over after after my brother wrote this article, and people were writing and saying, well, you know, he did bring lots of good things. He started, uh, I think, the Grey Nuns Hospital, I believe. I could be wrong about that, but. There's no question that he did lots of good things, but at what what at what point do we say, well, the things that he's done with residential schooling and other things with Aboriginals, at what point does that outweigh his contributions to society? So I think that's one big issue that comes out of um, this whole process and looking at the case of Margaret Thompson. And I think another equally important um, concern that comes out of this is the responsibility that 
um, healthcare professionals and researchers have to their their subject. I think this is we the other day in our medical school class we were watching um, a movie called um, what was it called? It was about the the Tuskegee trial. Mm. I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the documentary now. Mm. And that was the Tuskegee trial was all about. Um, uh, it was a it was a research trial done on African Americans in Texas, uh, researching how they uh, the course of syphilis in untreated patients. Right. So basically, well, even when they had the treatment for syphilis, when penicillin was widely available, they still didn't treat any of the African American men enrolled in that study, and just so that they could ostensibly watch the course of untreated syphilis, which is total, totally unethical. And uh, again, it it what one of the well, after watching that documentary, I realized that a lot of the time when we as uh, healthcare professionals and researchers are doing research on uh, people, we don't think of the data that we're extracting from their bodies as belonging to them. We, Especially with the way that uh, random controlled trials are done today, it's thousands of patients or tens of thousands of patients that are in enrolled in these trials. And we really see them as numbers or as um, statistics rather than actual people. And I think that we need to move towards a model that actually includes our participants as, as um, partners in our research and, uh, and recognize the fact that the, the data that we're extracting from these studies belongs to these people. I think the fundamental question, mm -hmm. like you were saying, th there was no advocate for the individual, and, and she could just go in and castrate uh, these poor Downs uh, patients for research tri um, purposes without, and she could do that without any censure because no one really looks at participants as people who have contributed data that's, that belongs to them in some sense. They're view reviewed as replaceable, as people who are just in a, in a study. So I think that's something that, that we really need to also start thinking about is how can we actually be, uh, move towards a model that will include our participants within our research. And I think even more importantly as a, a medical student, I'm realizing how important it is that we as healthcare professionals start to develop a sense of ethics. I mean, when we study ethics, it's, it's almost from the sense of like, well, I need to prevent myself from getting sued in a lawsuit, right? Whereas we're really not recognizing the implications of some of the things that we do and the ethical and moral implications of the way that we carry out treatment, the way that we do research. And I think it's very important that um, we all, as healthcare professionals in particular, um, start to develop a sense of ethics, a sense of morality that perhaps might even go beyond what the current norms are within the medical profession. Mm -hmm. So what always shocks me about um, sexual sterilization in Alberta is that you know all these surgeons are just carrying out you know carrying out these vas vasectomies carrying out these tubal ligations and you know you don't really hear anything anyone questioning the system right so the the question is where were where were those people because it's not just uh, the people at the top that are involved but it's people all the way through that have to start questioning why am I doing these operations why am I carrying out these procedures so yeah those are just some of the things that I I, I was thinking about when uh, Rob Wells kind of contacting me about this petition and Dr. Wilson asked me to come in and speak here. So if there are any direct questions, yeah. Thanks, Abel. <laughs> Quick question. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned David Ahedeku and uh, the famous five because I did write a letter to the Edmonton Journal in which I mentioned uh, David Henneke and, and the famous five recognized, uh, uh, recognized uh, by the Order of Canada for their, uh, for their contributions. And I quoted the president of the Canadian Federation of, uh, uh, or the Canadian Jewish Congress. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, I, and I was quoted by them in their website. This, this uh, letter to the editor was, uh, republished in their website, so I was very honored by that, but uh, I, I wished uh, that uh, that kind of dialogue would be perpetuated, and my wish is coming true, evidently. <laughs> Doug? Uh, 
in your current experience as a medical student, uh, you received instruction on the ethics of uh, medical practice, and in particular in the province of Alberta, do they teach today's medical students about what happened uh, in the era of the eugenics war and, and draw appropriate lessons from that? Well, we definitely get ethics lectures. And uh, I think that the faculty definitely recognizes the importance of ethics and the importance of us developing an ethical sense. But there, it's not as extensive as perhaps we need it to be. And maybe, you know, I'm only in my second year, so I know that I'm sure that there's going to be more of that uh, teaching that goes on when we actually get into our clinical years and perhaps when that becomes more relevant. But uh, I feel personal, on a personal level that we don't do enough. Have you ever heard the eugenics board? That, that we haven't. So I thought it I, kind of ironic. Actually, Glenn Greiner was one of the panelists when we, after we watched The Deadly Deception, that's what the movie was called, about the Tuskegee um, experiment. So Glenn Greiner was actually there, and I found it hilarious that no one mentioned the fact that we had Alberta, I mean, Alberta had been doing this until the 1970s. Uh, I, think, I think it's just too close to home. I, I don't know if we can really but look back and recognize lessons, lessons. I agree. I totally um, agree. Isn't this the best instruction is learning from negative examples from actual mistakes yeah, and violations? Absolutely. absolutely. And it's, easy, it's, it's so easy to look at the Tuskegee experiment and say, oh, that was wrong. But it's a little bit different when you realize, well, I mean, we were doing it right up until the 1970s. Yeah. And the Nazis came and studied our eugenics program here to set up theirs. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. something, it's a historical fact. Uh, I have a question for you. I, I really think this whole question of medical ethics is important. You mentioned tubal ligations. And, and, the, and the surgeons who were doing that, I, to my, my impression was like, wow, this is a chance to really practice. It wasn't just ligations, it was, no, they, were they, were, they were butchering, they were ripping out fallopian tubes completely. Yeah. So it wasn't the, wasn't the minimal amount, it was, well, let's just get in here. Yeah. And, and I, I'm sure if I was one of those surgeons too, I'd be like excited to get an opportunity to learn and, and, and do things, but where is this, this roadblock to like, wait a minute, that's the second thought, is this the right thing for the patient. Am I doing the right thing? Right. And I don't think anybody ever thought it was that stop to think about first do no harm. Well, I think and I kind of scared them a little bit when I was on that table that morning for the back. I was talking to Ann Henderson, who was our lab technician. I don't think she'd mind me using her name. I probably am not supposed to. Uh, but she was a friend of mine, and she was our lab technician. And I spoke to her that morning when I was at the clinical building to be sterilized. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? My life is over. I'm nothing. I'm a moron. I'm a number. I'm an idiot. That's it. My life is over. Totally over. I'm nothing. And, and I was totally stripped of, of everything, of, of everything, of who I was as a person. So and nobody else had to. She told you? Was she the one that told you? Told what, me what? What was happening? Is she the one that told yeah, me? Oh, no, no, there was another lady. There was another lady that I sat down with, and I asked her, and I said to her, see, because I had my appendix up when I was 10. Yeah. And I had a scar cut, a very real scar, and a very real surgery. Furthermore, it was emergency surgery. My, my uh, appendix burst on the operating table mm. when I was 10 years old. So later on, when I was about 13 years old, I said, I wish I could have been sterilized when I was 10 so that I wouldn't have to face another surgery. And I thought, oh my God, no, another surgery? Yes, because your body hadn't overlaid it. What did they do? What's this all about? Mm -hmm. And she and I and other girls, I don't know if Lelani was with me, but other girls sat on the grass and asked her the question, what's this all about? How is this done? Why are we sterilized and how are we sterilized? Well, every woman has two fallopian tubes in her stomach, and they're cut and they're tied. It's a five-minute procedure. Oh, no, it wasn't. No. Mine were cut and slashed to hell, because I went and had corrective surgery to see if I could have any children by Dr. Traff here in Edmonton, and he said it looked like hell. You were slashed to pieces. It was just like dog meat. Well, I think, I think it's like, I, I don't, honestly, I don't understand why this happened. I, don't, I, I think today, I mean, 
any anyone would be shocked that this happened. And, and I, I, I I definitely think that I'm sorry to cut you off, but fine. but I I think that we've definitely moved to more of a patient centered model now. And uh, I'll, no. I well I, at least that's what we're taught in uh, in medical school is really to think about the patient to be advocates for our patient. I think it's uh, actually a little bit presumptuous to to think that. Uh, that they like you know it's it's easy to look back and and say that why why did they do this I can't believe that they, this this happened and really it's it's impossible to understand how they could do this but on the other hand what it's not just uh, I think healthcare professionals that are at blame but it's a whole system that that exists right and uh, it's easy to look back and say well of course they shouldn't have been doing this but my real question is why did they they do this how did this all happened. How was it made acceptable for people to just go in and for no, absolutely no reason? To and it was so sad because the Moors couldn't have backed me up and say, she's normal, leave her alone, don't touch her. They were not related to me. My parents, aunts, uncles, nobody would step in or step up to the plate and say, she's normal, don't touch her. Um, on that operating table that morning, I said, I was speaking to Ann Henderson and I said, oh my God, I don't even want to face this. I'm not even going to go to the bathroom because I just don't want to live. And she said, well, if, the, if you don't do that, you'll really, you really wish you went to the bathroom because you wouldn't want the other treatment that takes the urine from you. I forget what it's called, but it's a very painful little procedure um, with a tube put in your body and, uh, and uh, everything made possible for you to have surgery. Um, and then I, I went to the washroom, all was fine. And there was three other girls ahead of me that one went in, the other went in, the other went in, and I was, Laying on that ceiling, looking at spots on the wall, like on the ceiling like this, and counting, oh my God, uh, one, two, three, four. And I just, what could I do besides pray and just stay civil, I guess. I went into the, I was rolled into the operating room, and I said to Dr. Levan, and to do, and a couple of other doctors who were there, can't remember the names, uh, and I said, one day you are going to be accountable for this. One day you are going to be accountable for what you did. I was put out and they went to town and they slashed me to pieces because they knew damn well I'd back up and do something about this. Even try to have children and I didn't. We're That's gonna, a very sad experience. Sorry. Uh, we're gonna open the floor for questions. I just wanna read one uh, pair of short paragraphs that are from a colleague about Margaret Thompson in particular that was news to me when I received it late last night. Um, and um, then we'll just open the, the floor. Um, so bear with me with this. Um, in 1964, so this is just after Margaret Thompson has left the U of A and the uh, Alberta Eugenics Board, um, publicly acknowledged the fact that the law, that is the Alberta Sexual Sterilization Act, uh, was scientifically indefensible. Dr. Thompson, giving a paper at the Federal Provincial Conference on Mental Retardation in Canada, argued that genetic counselling, not involuntary sterilisation, was most likely to prove useful. She told conference attendees that eugenic sterilization has little effect on the gene pool and suggested that it had been known to be based on faulty logic for nearly 50 years. This implied that the notion of eugenic sterilization had been known to be unsound throughout the entire history of the Alberta Eugenics Board and throughout her term on the board authorizing sterilizations. According to Thompson, there was a time, nearly half a century ago, when it was believed that sterilization of mental defectives would, quote, improve the race. She also in asserted that, quote, the positive genetic effect of sterilizations in Canada is negligible, end quote. And she later reiterated, quote, I said that sterilization of defective children was not particularly helpful eugenically, end quote. In spite of the fact that she considered sterilization had virtually no genetic value and uncertain social value, she asserted that, quote, little may be lost by these eugenic sterilizations, end quotes. Dr. Thompson's remarks were made in the first plenary session and the proceedings of the conference were available to all delegates of the conference. Amongst those listed as attending was L.J. Levan, Medical <coughs> Superintendent, Provincial Training School in Red Deer, Alberta. Dr. Levan should also have been aware of one of the recommendations of the study groups of the conference that, quote, suitable standards for institutional care be drawn up and enforced. Thompson's position was the exact opposite of Premier Brownlee's opinion back in 1928. He acknowledged that it was the intrusion on individual rights, but considered effectiveness of the procedures unquestionable and the benefits to society to be so great that it justified the intrusion. By contrast, Dr. Thompson argued that the practice had little or no value, but that didn't matter. 
because the intrusion on the rights of people such as those at the Red Deer uh, facilities, those at the Red Deer facilities, was simply not important, end quote. When, when was that conference? Nineteen eighty-eight. Nineteen sixty-four. Oh, my God. Doug, and then Maura, you had a question before, if it's still around. I did, yeah, it's, it's okay, go ahead. I mean, Amir raised this question too, like, how could they do this? Exactly. You know, something that was so obviously wrong, and here she herself is admitting that it really wasn't effective, but it didn't matter anyway. So, you know, I've read quite a bit about these events, and I've been interested in eugenics for years and years, and when you distill it down, it seems to me that what's behind all of this, why, why, why could they do this, uh, is a view that the disabled are not fully human. It's not true. Uh, that they do not deserve human rights, and they do not deserve equal protection under the law as able-bodied people. That's the assertion that Margaret Thompson made in the 1995 trial. Um, that would have been a good opportunity for her to pretend <laughs> what had been done <laughs> in, in, you know, in the, in the uh, earlier time, but she did. She defended it. She said that no harm was done by <laughs> mutilating a Down syndrome boy. Would she have the same view if somebody were to grab her husband, tie him down, and remove one of his testicles. Yeah. You yeah. know? Is that okay too? What's the difference? The difference is one of these people happen to have a defect in his chromosome. Chromosome number 21. He had three of them. Does that make somebody no longer human? <coughs> because they happen to have an extra chromosome number 21. Bi biologically and medically, we know this is complete and utter nonsense, but there was a time uh, before we really understood what Down syndrome was where people did believe that these children were not really fully human. In fact, it used to be called mongoloid idiocy. They were taken to be a, uh, a reversion, an atavism, to an earlier stage of human evolution. They literally, by the medical profession were not believed to be fully human. So what I'm suggesting is that all of the conduct of the Eugenics Board in Alberta and Margaret Thompson indicate that they still adhere to this view that somebody that harbors <coughs> some kind of a major problem with their chromosomes or their genes mm -hmm. is not fully human and therefore does not deserve the same kind of human rights and the same protection under Canadian law as able-bodied people. And personally, I think that's a reprehensible view. And I, I, I thank you very much for raising this issue and bringing it before the uh, Committee of the Order of Canada. Mm -hmm. Because thank you. it's, in my view, I, I'm a, oh, by the way, I am a geneticist and I study genes and behavior. <laughs> uh, it really is a, a blight on our profession to have people taking positions like this in this day and age. This, this is recent history. You know, <laughs> this is not a hundred years ago. But there's another aspect of that too that I think we're kind of in denial about, that there was an attitude in Canada that the highest level of humanity was British Anglo-Saxon stock. Yes. <laughs> And then you had, you know, the racism for the Chinese people, the, the slabs yes. that came in and so on. And it was, there was this, this double, double layer. And I think, I think most of that has disappeared now, but there's still elements of that racism here where there's one certain segment of society which is above another. And we got that soaked up. We weren't directly taught that, but it was sort of... Part of the way we were taught and part of the curriculum, I think, and all the achievements were from British people and, you know, that, yeah. that kind of crap. And it's crap. But it's built in this idea that there's a certain segment of people who are superior than others. And then you've built this, this layers of, of, of less and less and less human people. 
And when you strip people of their humanity, it becomes much more easy to do this sort of thing. And, and I'm concerned about, you know, the ethics today of, like, the, um, the net care system. Mm -hmm. Everybody there is a lab rat for researchers. <laughs> and I cannot, I cannot get myself out of net care. The only way I do that is to go and use, a, use, a, use a, an assumed name to a doctor and pay my fee and have it not go on net care. Now, there's something unethical about that, but I don't hear a single doctor saying anything about it because, oh, it's all these benefits. Well, as far as I know, I don't think you can use information from net care for research without telling people first. But uh, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of ways. <laughs> Moira? Um, I just, you know, I, I had a, a comment. Um, eugenics, the whole practice of eugenics has been kind of removed from our history books, right? We, we don't talk about it. I know uh, lots of the, uh, you know, I've had two kids go through public schools. It's a system. It's not come up in their education. Um, lots of our interns are hearing about it for the first time when they reach post-secondary. Um, so I guess, you know, my undergrad degree was in history and one of the things that was really, really um, important, I think, when we look about history was to contextualize. So I, like, I really don't understand the push to you know, remove the famous five from the history books. I think that, um, uh, not that I'm in support of their work that they did as uh, you know, pro-eugenics, but I think that that's almost become a way nowadays, it, contemporarily, for um, anti-feminist right-wing Christian organizations to attack feminism and say look at look at the famous five those very first feminists in Canada and what they were up to they were supporting eugenics so it's almost become this way to attack uh, a movement that actually has done a great service to a great number of people so uh, I worry about you know, I've heard people talk about we should have the parks renamed, we should have their plaques taken down, and this and that. I think that those are opportunities to educate, mm -hmm. and we run, we walk a real fine line then if we just start to remove the famous five from history, mm -hmm. uh, then young women not ever knowing that at one time they were legally considered chattel and, and had to actually fight to be recognized as people. Um, and that's, you know, I think we've done that by removing eugenics from our history books. So, and I mean the same with, with uh, Margaret Thompson, not that I think she should be, you know, wearing a little medal on her lapel as she goes about town, but um, these are opportunities to educate people. I think, you know, um, what even got said I, you know, in, in the trial, Sandra, Sandra Anderson, you know, really succinctly put Margaret Thompson in her place. It was quite revealing. And so those are moments to actually educate. Those are the times, you know, to have these discussions. Um, because it is so easy to sit here in 2011 and say in 1929, those people had it all wrong and we should rewrite history so that because we know a lot more now in 2011 i just you know then i kind of think about there's other members of the team on the living archives who say that's exactly what we're doing right now with nrt's new reproductive technologies that this is the new eugenics and um that we've just removed the middleman of the the institution Right by doing the oh I you know the prenatal counseling uh, where you know gee you're at risk of having a child with just me 21 and then this whole supposed we'll just give you information and you decide you know as if the patient has as much agency um, as the doctor right. in, in that sort of situation and, and how that falls out. I mean, so really in 50 years, we're going to look back and go, oh my God, look at those NRTs and what they were doing with those, those people really are whacked. They were, it was wrong. It was bad. Let's take that out of history or let's rewrite that a bit according to what we know now, the, uh, you know, 
and not to condemn what they were doing, but I think there might, you know, it was a predominant, it was a new science. And I think it's easy to think it, it's a way that they dealt with social problems of the time, mm -hmm. for sure. It was, it was, you know, and I don't, you know, I would disagree with you, Rob Wells, about that I think that we don't think that the Anglo-Saxon is the best way to go. I think that since, you know, post 9-11, now we just have a new target. Exactly. Now we have Arabs and Muslims as this, uh, this dangerous sect, you know, and, 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 and under the name and guise of let's get safe, we've created a whole new way to have acceptable racism. So, like, I just think all of these sort of historical happenings are actually a way to provoke thought, to have, to critically question, but I don't think there's one answer. And I, I, I get a little bit nervous when we forget about contextualizing history and when we forget about, or when we want to just remove something. Well, on the removal, I want to say something briefly about that. I mean, I, I'm sure there are people who talk about taking people out of the history, you start with the famous five, mm -hmm. but I've never heard that myself because to some extent, I think if I heard I would have registered it quite strongly because it sounds so absurd. You can't actually take people out of history. You can draw attention to aspects that are overlooked and that's a kind of contextualization that I think we're probably on the same page of. Yeah. And that's certainly what would happen and has, I think, been happening with the famous are revealing some of the complexities and some of the puzzles, yeah. I think. It's not an either or, either or, or all or nothing sort of matter. Mm -hmm. And the Thompson case, we might find it a little more pronounced, but I think you can make that same sort of case if you think about the milieu at the time, the attitudes and views. It's not to exonerate or to excuse and say, well, right. that's just how it was. But again, we add that complexity back into that. So what's being removed, I think, is the pedestal mm. that people are put up on because it's, they're thought about it in such an uncritical way. And yeah. what you don't want to do in removing that is then to demonize them yeah. in a way that would kind of, in some sense, unfairly pick them out amongst the other people. And this is why I was asking questions partly about what's... I think there are special things about the Thompson case. I think a lot of it's got to do with the fact she was a geneticist. Yeah. And this kind of thing I've just read from suggests yeah. it wasn't just that, oh, well, genetics in Alberta was just different from genetics <laughs> in the rest of them. No. She kind of knew the facts and just disregarded them for the reasons I think that Doug was alluding to, which is, well, it's, it's like essentially, you know, people with disabilities, at least certain kinds of disabilities, were regarded literally as lab rats. It really didn't matter. They weren't accorded the sorts of protections. It just didn't, and she's prepared to stand behind that 30 years later still. And that's part of what's, I think, horrific and drawing attention to that, right? Yeah. And so, and removing the little lapel, again, it's, I think Rob's put his, uh, finger on something that's important about that. that's one of the highest honors if not the highest honor um, that's given out by the country and the question to ask in my mind is if they had known what we know now or what we could present now about Margaret Thompson would they have given that order of Canada in 1988 yeah. and I only cross my fingers and hope that the answer is there's no way they would have done that mm -hmm. and then if that's the answer I think there's a kind of obligation on the appropriate citizens whoever to pull together that information in that right way and ask the question in that sort of way and hope that they would have the courage to respond in an appropriate way. I think what Moira is saying is so critical to this whole discussion because we want, and, and what you're saying Dr. Wilson as well, is that we want to raise awareness. We, want, we actually want to put context back into history. We don't want to view the Famous Five as being these amazing forces for feminism only or that they were these demonic forces for uh, eugenics either. We want to be able to look at history in a somewhat complicated, somewhat more uh, nuanced way. And the only way that we can do that is by raising the issue, like Rob Wells is doing with his petition, but at the same time not burying them. And I think that balancing act isn't necessarily the easiest thing to do because in, in a lot of ways, the way that we've given people honors, the way that our public spaces are set up gives only one side of the story. So like the work that we're doing, yeah. for example, with the Glide mural in Rutherford South, yeah. that mural dominates the entire library. And it, it's a public, in a, in a very public way, and there's nothing that you can say back to it. There's no way that you can sort of contextualize it. And I think it's the loss of context that petitions like this actually address and kind of rectify. Mm -hmm. I'll just kind of quickly, Moya, I, I, I agree with you, but 
not to the extent of whitewashing the atrocities or the wrongdoing. We have to acknowledge the whole picture and not just part of the picture. Yes, the famous five did great things for the famous five. They did great oh, things for, for, your, for, for, for British women so that, so that uh, what's her name could be, become the, uh, the first senator, whatever. Uh, the person's case, yes. But and also, we cannot whitewash the fact that they were racist. That, that uh, they were talking about the yellow peril and, and the racism there, we cannot whitewash that. And when we whitewash those kind of things is when the danger of us losing the reality and learning from the past, which is so important that we do learn from our past, not ignore it. Enough. Right, and I'm, I'm not at all suggesting we whitewash it, not yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. I'm suggesting we contextualize it. And so what Amir was saying is, is talk about it as, uh, you know, th it was this and it was that. And this is actually what was going on, and not to try to make it appear nicer than it should appear, mm -hmm. but uh, you know to try to be more realistic about it. We'll close with a couple more questions. Jack, did you? Uh, the idea of what is past. Um, what we've been talking about, what you've been talking about, is not past. Yeah. I mean, it's part of the last 140 years. I mean, it's now, 140 years ago, they were arguing over the same e ecological things that we are arguing about today. Mm -hmm. And the racism and it is still present amongst major governing people in Toronto. Uh, the it, it is continuing. You, the, the president of the United States still does the same things that has happened in in the Second World War. Uh, it's it, it is our present, mm -hmm. and we have to. It, it, it has not been dealt with. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's just. But the, otherwise, yes, I fully agree with you. But mm -hmm. present and past, I, I think we need a, a, a totally different timeline. Sorry. Doug, did you want to? I was just going to uh, point out one thing. Like, there's a big difference between a Nobel Prize and the Order of Canada, in that uh, a Nobel Prize, it would only be withdrawn. It's for a specific achievement, something somebody did. It's not for their life's work. It's not saying this is a fine, wonderful individual, nothing like that. Right. Yeah. So you have some raving idiot like William Shockley, who uh, you know wanted to donate sperm to a sperm bank when he was 70 years old to presumably increase the intelligence of the United States. Who <laughs> 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 had a Nobel Prize, and that's why anybody even cared whether he was willing to donate sperm or not. Uh, but he got it for inventing the transistor which was a very significant thing. And the same thing with James Watson. Right. You know, he's a raving racist. He is an embarrassment. Uh, but he did figure out with Crick the structure of DNA, which is, is a very significant thing. OK. The, the Order of Canada seems to me to be giving a stamp of approval and adulation to somebody's entire life's work. Uh, and that's a little different. Uh, so, but I, one thing, I think you should continue with this, and one thing that occurs to me, the Order of Canada, you look at somebody's whole life work, I don't know what it was that Margaret Thompson did that was so great that she ought to have the thing all. <laughs> she wrote some books, I guess, I don't know. She, so, she, she did a lot of so, research. You know, <laughs> but, you know, that's an interesting question, but surely, doesn't the Order of Canada need a way to provide an annotation to an order to inform the public, to increase our understanding of history? I think it needs a way to, to make that known. So that if somebody finds here and you know on their website, here's this Margaret Thompson, and also, well, then she did this and this, and by and to tell people 
tell the public that by giving them the order of candidate, this is not meant to mean that we approve. Mm -hmm. But I think Dr. Walston, if you look, I did looked at last night actually about the order of Canada. It's given for a specific kind of achievement that they've done, some outstanding service that they've done to Canada. So, like for example, for mm -hmm. Dr. Thompson, the reason why, or at least the, what they had on the Order of Canada website, is that the reason why she was given the Order of Canada is because of her work in um, genetics and muscular dystrophy in particular. Well, so, I, not that I disagree with you, but I'm just saying that uh, it's not as different as from the Nobel Prize. It says that that lifetime achievement. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I'm just saying. And it says enrich the lives of others. Yeah. Yeah. A few, not at the expense yeah. of some others. I don't yeah. know. So that, that's an interesting point. That might, uh, but it, still, it, it seems to me that it maybe just in the interest of good people, you know, a moral justification that really uh, I think the Order of Canada should be obligated to inform, to tell the truth, and the fuller truth. Not digging up dirt, okay. but Margaret Thompson came before a court, an open court, you know, years after these things happened, and still argued in principle that this was okay. Now, wouldn't <laughs> history be better served by making sure that people today know that. Well, one way to do that is, I mean, I, I'm not sure that we can really compete with the Order of Canada, but if mm -hmm. we were able to award the Order of Eugenesis, the OE, to people, <laughs> uh, we could give our own <laughs> citation hey, for their membership. Like and like You know, it. the Ig Nobel Prize. Right. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a way no. to inform. Yeah. And I, I bet that uh, uh, we, we, we would quickly gain some prominence right. uh, in the online world. So if people are searching for Margaret Thompson, mm -hmm. um, already uh, the discussion of the petition, if you type Margaret Thompson's name in, it comes up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it may be something you think yeah. about. If she's embraced, we're going to lose the whole point of Lalani Loop making that point. Um, Lalani set the precedent for all of us sterilized uh, victims and, and incarcerated victims, and she won. And hey, we better put something up there for Lalani too. <laughs> you know, give her an order of, what's yeah. the word? I'm not educated, oh, yeah, so <laughs> declaration or something, because look what she's done. Yeah. Look what she's done. I could not have done what she did, but I sure will stand behind her. There's nothing else I can do. And well, speak up for myself, because damn it, I was normal, and I'm still normal. The, the Order of Canada also is, is Rep is awarded by the Governor General as the head of of Canada. The, the what do you, what do you call it? The Queen's representative. The Queen's representative. Yeah. So representing all of Canada. So there is me as one of the thirty some million Canadians is honoring this person, and I find it just offensive. <laughs> And I, I don't mean to, in any of my comments, to problematize that. I, like, I totally agree with that idea. I don't think we should be giving Dr. Thompson or anyone who was involved in this to Order of Canada. I just, the question I always ask is a, is a, a broader one and so that we can actually put context back into the way that we look at things, not just look at it with a monochromatic kind of view of, of history. Okay, we should close things formally, but uh, you've got to hang around and talk a bit more. But first, uh, join me in uh, thanking our speakers, uh, Rob Wells and Amir Farouk.